Good afternoon and welcome to our panel on the Civil War here at the Ball State Student History Conference. My name is Scott Steffen. I'm a professor in the Ball State Department of History and I'm also helping to organize our Student History Conference this year. So I appreciate you joining us um, today in our panel, which is Military and Political Histories of the US Civil War. Uh, we're gonna have three excellent presentations. Uh, these are all Ball State students uh, who completed their work in Professor Edgerson's Civil War history class. Uh, the organization is going to be this and a little bit of housekeeping along the way too. Uh, what I'll do is um, offer some br very brief comments up front. I will introduce each one of our three panelists and then um, after I do that they will give their approximately 15 to 16 minute presentation. Uh, at the end of those three presentations I will give some comments to try and bring things together, uh, raise some initial questions uh, but our hope here is that as we go through uh, this process, uh, that you will use the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your bar here um, on the Zoom window, um, and type in some questions um, at any point in time uh, during our presentations today or during the, the end, we'll address those. Um, and then I've also invited the panelists to ask each other questions. Um, all right, so we're going to get started here formally. Um, a couple of things that um, I want you to be thinking about as we um, just for frame, since I've had a sneak peek of these papers. Um, a few of the big questions these students um, ask, and one of the things that I really appreciate about this is they're asking really big questions. Uh, these are um, important figures in Civil War history. So we're talking about Lincoln, McClellan, and Stonewall Jackson. Um, some of the larger questions that are, they're posing here today are, how did politics shape the coming of the Civil War? Why was it so costly? How have heroes, legends, and villains been constructed over time in this conflict? And how do we untangle reality from myth? So I want you to be thinking about those um, as we work our way through these papers. All right, so our lead off today will be Thomas Scare. Do I have that correct, Thomas? Yeah. Okay. Um, and his paper is Why Lincoln Won the Midwest. Uh, he is a sophomore history major. Uh, his interests center on elections and political science. So we're gonna be right in his wheelhouse today. Um, and he is focusing on the election of 1860. So I will let him uh, take it away. All right, just gonna have to share my screen, make sure everything looks all right. Is this showing up the same for everyone? It's good. All right. Well, first, I'd just like to thank everyone involved in putting on this conference, especially given the circumstances of it. I'd like to thank the people who reviewed my paper and I'd like to especially thank Dr. Etchison for all the that uh, all the help she gave with this research. I'm sure the other presentees can attest to just how helpful of a professor she could be. So my presentation today is on the election of 1860 and specifically why Lincoln won the Midwest. The election of 1860 was one of the most consequential in American history. It brought the Republican Party and Abraham Lincoln to power and precipitated the Civil War. And of course, 1860 was the first victory for the young Republican Party. These are all things that we all already know. But what we may not know is that this victory was owed to the states of Indiana and Illinois, two states Lincoln won in 1860 that Fremont, the party's nominee four years earlier, had lost. It warrants the question of why did these states support Lincoln in 1860 over the other candidates available? What changed? Well, the Republican Party won in Illinois and Indiana, not because of vote splitting, but because the GOP effectively shifted their party platform and policy ideas to appeal to the American Midwest at a time when other parties were neglecting their interests. Lots of electioneering factors played into 1860, and many of them are not too different from trends we see today. So first off, there is a very easy to make misconception that, much, that uh, must be dispensed with. Abraham Lincoln won less than 40% of the national popular vote, and he did so while facing off against three other opponents. So it's therefore easy, even logical, to say that Lincoln must have won in Indiana and Illinois because of vote splitting and by a plurality. This is not true. Lincoln won a majority of the vote in these states, capturing 51.09% in Indiana and 50.69% in Illinois, both against multiple candidates. These are, of course, very slim majorities. If, this, if uh, results like that came in today, we would consider that quite tight, but Lincoln's facing off against three other guys, so that's really rather impressive. So 
putting together the votes of his opposition would not have lost him these states. Putting together the votes of his opposition would have, however, cost him the votes of California and Oregon. As you can see there on the map in the West, uh, his support is a lot less unified. So had he hypothetically lost these states due to a unified opposition, it would have been his majorities in Indiana and Illinois that secured his electoral victory. So what we can see is that he did not win here due to vote splitting, but indeed his majorities here are what protected his victory from the potential of vote splitting. The first factor that actually did lead to Lincoln winning these states is an obvious one. He was a Midwesterner. In 1856, the Republican Party had followed the old Whig tradition in candidate selection by nominating an apolitical war hero in John C. Fremont. This was in the mold of Zach Taylor and Winfield Scott, Whig candidates earlier, famous generals not really known for much in the way of politics. In 1860, they did not follow this tradition, instead going with, of course, Abraham Lincoln of Illinois. In the 19th century, and even today, candidates usually carry their home states, and so it makes sense that if Republicans wanted to win in the Midwest and appeal to those voters, they would nominate a Midwesterner. This was especially important considering the fact that the Northern Democrats had nominated Stephen Douglas, seen there on the right. Lincoln very clearly had a great deal of support from the Midwest, which can be seen in the voting at the Republican National Convention. On the first ballot at the convention, Lincoln received votes from the entire delegations of Indiana and Illinois, clearly showing that he was the favorite of those states. And as you can see on the first ballot, Seward, William Seward, his chief rival, had a lot more support nationwide, but by going with Lincoln rather than Seward, the Republican Clark Party was clearly sending a message to Midwestern voters that the Republican Party valued them and their interests. Another factor, <clears throat> excuse me, another factor relating to candidate selection is that the party nominated someone considered to be a moderate. I know that we often don't think of Lincoln as a moderate after the actions during the Civil War, but you go back to 1860 and for Republican Party standards, he was considered to be a lot more middle of the road. And the Republican Party nominated this middle of the road guy over the previously mentioned William Seward of New York, who was seen as the far more radical candidate. This went all the way back to 1850 when Seward had given his higher law speech in which he insinuated that the laws of God, the Bible, morality, etc., were of a higher authority than the Constitution. This was seen as extremely radical at the time and even many of Seward's supporters were very taken back by it. Such radical rhetoric uh, might have won the GOP more support in the more abolitionist supporting Northeast, but in the Midwest where such sentiments were a lot more muted, they weren't gonna get much from it. People in Indiana were not big friends to slavery, but they're nowhere near as zealous against it as you're gonna find in a place like Massachusetts. So in avoiding the mistake of nominating a radical like Seward and instead nominating Lincoln, the Republicans set themselves up for victory in these important swing states. The next major factor leading to Lincoln's victory was that the Republican platform was designed to appeal to Midwesterners in several ways. Though not wholly different from their uh, party platform four years earlier, the platform in 1860 offered several policies and positions that would appeal to voters in Illinois and Indiana. The most important of these is the promise of a Homestead Act, which appeared in the platform. This act would give very cheap land to settlers looking to move into the Western territories. Such a proposal naturally appealed to Midwesterners looking to own cheap land when they were unable to do so in their own states. At the time, the states of Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, they're really starting to fill up. And so your young, less wealthy people looking to buy a farm are having a hard time doing so. That picture in the upright there is of course after it was passed and uh, doesn't look like much, doesn't look like much today, but such a, getting such land like that for free was still considered quite a boon for people. And in 1860, Congress actually did pass a Homestead Act, and this was then vetoed by President Buchanan. Through this veto, the idea of a Homestead Act became definitively Republican, and therefore if someone uh, wanted to see it implemented, they better vote Republican. And of course, no other party in 1860 promised such an act in their platform. Uh, additionally, the Republican Party supported the construction of a transcontinental railroad, something that would be completed decade later in the picture there on the bottom right. 
There had long been calls to build such a railroad and the Republican party had promised to do so in 1856 as well. And it should be said that in 1860, both the Northern and the Democratic fact and the Southern factions of the Democratic party also promised to build one. Heck, if, if the Constitutional Union party actually published a, pro a platform, even they probably would have supported the idea. But there was still reason for someone from Indiana or Illinois to support uh, the Republicans on this issue in regards to a railroad over the Democrats. The Democratic Party had a far worse record on public spending, going back to their founder, Andrew Jackson, who was, of course, notably opposed to such projects. Their platform four years earlier in 1856 even bluntly said, quote, the Constitution does not confer upon the general government the power to commence and carry on a general system of internal improvements. I don't know about you, but that definitely sounds to me like they're not going to build a railroad. And I don't think I'd believe a party would be adamant about a certain belief that they just changed their minds about. It makes a lot more sense that the promise to build a transcontinental railroad would be taken more seriously by the Republicans who had broadly supported public improvements and had largely inherited the old Whig economic program. Another small caveat to the uh, railroad issue is that the Democrats with their base in the South were more likely to build a transcontinental railroad along a Southern route. Whereas of course, if you're a Northerner, you want it going through your home state because that's where the money is. So if you're a Republic, so if you're uh, from Indiana or, or Illinois, that's just one more reason to vote Republican. You want the railroad going through Chicago, not Jackson. On the other end of the party spectrum, the Democratic platform offered very little of interest to the Midwest. Even the Northern Democratic platform uh, primarily spends most of its length calling for policies that would appeal to Southern voters. These included repeated calls for the enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Act, a promise to respect the Dred Scott decision, and even acquiring the island of Cuba. That's going to appeal to the Hoosiers, isn't it? Uh, none of these policies would appeal to a Midwesterner, and the closest thing that the platform does is promise a transcontinental railroad, which, as previously mentioned, was also called for by the Republicans. There is no promise or proposal to aid the ailing farmers of the Midwest, who at the time were still greatly suffering from the Panic of 1857. Following said panic and the recession, uh, for example, wheat prices had dropped dramatically, and by 1860, they had not even close to recovered. So your average Hoosier farmer is not doing well in 1860. Mm -hmm. President Buchanan, a Democrat, had done nothing uh, to aid this economic crisis, and the Democratic Party platform in 1860 continued to promise to do nothing about it. Despite everything I say today, this might end up being the biggest uh, factor here. There's the phrase from the 1992 election, it's the economy, stupid. That was definitely true then, and I think there's a lot of evidence to show it was true in 1860. It's very natural for public opinion to turn against the party in power when there's a recession, and of course that's only going to be made worse when said party in power does nothing about it. Ultimately, what we see a lot of with the Republican and Democratic parties in both their platforms, their candidate selections, and even their strategies is that the Democrats are focused on appeasing and appealing to their base, whereas the Republican party is prioritizing appealing to swing voters. It's not surprising that the party appealing to the swing voters and to the moderates then won. A last uh, cherry on top for the woes of the Democratic Party is just that it was quite frankly very unpopular by 1860. Capturing the national mood is of course quite difficult, but you don't need modern polls and analytics to see that the Buchanan administration was unpopular, seen as incompetent, and even corrupt. Uh, lots of cartoons from the era show the mood towards Buchanan and therefore the Democrats, as you can see there on the right. The, national bird having lost its feathers due to the incompetence of the Buchanan administration. Of course, James Buchanan was not on the ballot in 1860, but the memory of him was still extremely fresh, and so it would make sense that people would want to try something else. This view of Buchanan as a corrupt insider was contrasted with Abraham Lincoln, who we of course remember as Honest Abe, an image that they were touting as early as that election, as you can see with the contrasting cartoon there on the left. 
those campaigning for Lincoln really played up this angle in 1860, and we really see a political outsider coming to drain the swamp, if you will, to borrow another piece of modern political rhetoric. In summary, Lincoln prevailed in Indiana and Illinois for really pretty clear cut and obvious reasons. American elections often involve accusations of vote splitting, meddling, and interference, but none of that was the case here. No, the Republicans won because they presented a coherent and legitimate appeal to the people of Indiana and Illinois by nominating one of their own and pitching policies that appealed to them, all at a time when other candidates neglected the region, took its support for granted, and uh, simply were unpopular. The election of 1860 shows the electioneering consequences of prioritizing your base over swing voters and the importance of campaigning to every demographic and region you're trying to win. In that way, the election of 1860 is not so different from today. Thank you, Thomas. Um, go ahead and close out your screen there. Thank you. Um, all right. So next, uh, we're going to flip flop a little bit on your program today. So uh, we had Caitlin in the third spot. We're going to move her up um, to the second spot today. So we'll hear now about George McClellan as commander of the Union Army. Um, a couple things about Caitlin. Uh, she's from Bedford, Indiana, of course, a Ball State student like all of our uh, panelists, a history major with a minor in religious studies. Um, she really enjoyed uh, this the course from which the uh, paper originates from, Dr. Edgerson's Civil War class, uh, and really enjoys to read. So we'll let Caitlin take it away. Hi, I'm Caitlin, um, and I would like to start off by kind of explaining what my paper was. Um, this is for Dr. Edgerson's History 407 Civil War class, and um, I chose to do mine on George B. McClellan as commander in the Union Army. Um, and my paper is a historiography paper, which is um, what other historians have talked about and researched this topic and just kind of seeing what they have said about it. Um, and then just to give you like a little background information on George McClellan, he was um, the commander of the Army of the Potomac for the first half of the war. And he was from Pennsylvania and um, he was an indecisive man who overestimated his enemy and underestimated himself as well as his army. Um, so I'm going to read you my paper. George B. McClellan is arguably one of the worst war generals there has been in American history, which means there has been much speculation on his actions throughout his time as commander in the Civil War. McClellan was notorious for being overly cautious in battle and snobbish off the battlefield even with President Abraham Lincoln. Over time, those who have studied the Civil War came to the realization that McClellan was not fit for the position he was put in due to his arrogance and incompetence. While George McClellan was valuable in organizational techniques for the Army, he had the potential to be an amazing general had he listened to the advice the administration and Congress suggested, as well as gained the confidence to overcome his overcautiousness. George B. McClellan was a part of the upper middle class, which allowed him the opportunity to attend and graduate from the University of Pennsylvania Preparatory School, as well as West Point. There are some scholars who are in agreement with the tactics that McClellan implemented, so much so that they praise him. In Warren Hassler's 1957 General George B. McClellan, Shield of the Union, he writes that an impatient public, Congress, and administration largely ignorant of the real military conditions, could not readily appreciate McClellan's seemingly dilatory methods. This quotation disqualifies anyone who was not actively serving in the military as having any idea of what it was like to be in the military. While it is true that not everyone has military experience, there are those who have previously served that were a part of the public, Congress, and the administration that knew McClellan was being overly cautious and would need to make a move soon. On the contrary, there are men like Joseph B. Mitchell, the author of Military Leaders in the Civil War, who were less than amazed by George McClellan's ability to lead in the Civil War. This book was published in 1999, which is around 40 years later than what Hassler's George B. McClellan was written. McClellan was arrogant when it came to what he thought were his abilities to lead the Union Army. For example, the way that McClellan spoke to and treated President Abraham Lincoln should not have been tolerated from a military leader. 
In reference to a few messages that McClellan wrote back to Washington, blaming President Lincoln, Mitchell writes, it is appalling to think that a general commanding a great army would talk like this to the President of the United States. It makes sense that those who read McClellan's messages to Washington were shocked at the level of disrespect shown to the President of the United States, especially from a man commanding the Union Army. <sighs> Publicly undermining the President during a wartime was not doing any favors to anyone involved. Mitchell wondered if McClellan was just anxious to get out of Lincoln's control because his attitude had been peculiar from the beginning. McClellan's personality was not one of great leadership quality. He was a very self-absorbed man who had thought highly of himself, though he did not have many great accomplishments under his belt from his time as general in the Civil War. From the book, McClellan and Failure, a study of Civil War fear, incompetence, and worse by Edward H. Bonekemper, there are examples of other telegrams that McClellan sent back to Washington, complaining about Washington not having the appropriate amount of empathy for him. McClellan wrote many telegraphs to Washington and his wife that complained about how Washington was either incompetent or blatantly trying to make his life harder. In one instance, when Winfield Scott reprimanded McClellan, McClellan for how he phrased his complaints. McClellan made it clear to not use his name in that way, which made it obvious that McClellan was only truly loyal to himself. George McClellan had the capability to accomplish great things, which is evident when Mitchell wrote that great things were expected of McClellan and for a time he appeared capable of fulfilling the highest expectations. Due to George McClellan's inability to take risks on the battlefield, there were many missed opportunities to make huge strides for the Union. In Lincoln and McClellan at War, Chester G. Hearn quotes two historians who have opposing ideas on McClellan, but essentially say that if McClellan had pushed harder, the battles would have ended earlier and he would not have thrown away a precious opportunity of making a name, great name. Within those two sentences by Hearn, we have three historians agree that McClellan had every chance to achieve something great within the entire week that ended with the Battle of Antietam. McClellan was on the cusp of being a great general, but managed to bungle each opportunity he got. He did not make, or he did make small strides in slightly improving warfare techniques. techniques. For example, by normalizing the military telegraph, McClellan had the ability to change battle plans numerous times throughout the course of a few days, which had not been done in military history before. Due to organizational techniques or organizational and tactical problems, military signals became essential. General McClellan was actually an innovator on the telegraphic signals. While George McClellan may not have been an outstanding Union Army general, he was helpful when it came to organizational techniques that were the basis for modern day warfare. For the most part, historians and scholars would agree that George McClellan was not the best option to be the general of the Union Army. The only author in this paper that seemed to think highly of George McClellan was Warren Hassler, who wrote his book in 1957. There were times where he did agree that McClellan could have done more to be more successful. The authors Joseph Mitchell, Edward Bonekemper, Chester G. Hearn, and Edward Hagerman all had some sort of disproving tone of McClellan's actions as general. In one way or another, these authors believed that George McClellan had numerous opportunities to be a great leader, but he just missed the mark. It is also fair to point out that these authors all wrote their books within the last 25 years. More information could have come to light for them to study that potentially was not available to Warren Hassler in 1957. Overall, General George B. McClellan was not the best general to lead the Union Army. He let his fear of taking risks get in the way of pushing himself and his men hard in order to bring victory for the North. Had McClellan taken the advice of the administration and Congress, the war would have probably ended a few years earlier than what it did. Overcoming his overcautiousness and opening up to the idea of taking more risk could have put McClellan at the status of a competent army general. Yet historians over time have regarded McClellan as arguably one of the worst generals in American history. Fantastic, thank you so much, Caitlin.
All right. Um, our third paper today uh, will be from uh, Jake Biller. Um, a little bit about uh, Jake. Uh, he is a recent Ball State graduate. Um, he's received his uh, bachelor's degree in telecommunications uh, just this past uh, December. He is now uh, living in Goshen, Indiana, uh, working as a photojournalist there uh, in South Bend. His goal is to one day pursue a career in Hollywood, uh, directing films for the big screen. Um, though he didn't receive his degree in history, uh, Jake took several classes on our department and has a great passion for the Civil War, especially when it comes to how the conflict is remembered and how it affects us today. So we've got a great transition here. We go from a much maligned general to a, a much um, celebrated general. And Jake, uh, in his paper, Brave Men of the Valley, a historiographical examination of the Stonewall Brigade, will take a look at that. Thank you. All righty. Uh, first off, I uh, just want to say uh, thank you to my fellow presenters on this panel. Thank you for, for Dr. Stefan for organizing this. And of course, thank you to Dr. Edgerson for um, uh, all her help with all the research and everything. Um, so like Caitlin, my, my paper was a historiography. So again, we're tracking, you know, how histor historians have interpreted um, not just uh, Stonewall Jackson, but specifically the Stonewall Brigade over time and how, you know, opinions and interpretations have changed. So um, I guess to begin my presentation, I want to start with a really brief anecdote. It's a familiar anecdote, um, probably for those of you who, who know you're are well versed in your Civil War history. And um, there's a newspaper man who was following uh, General Jackson as he's moving up and down the valley in 1862 on his valley campaign. And he asked him, he said, General, how do you feel about your new nickname, Stonewall? You know, obviously the, his nickname earned uh, after First Battle of Bull Run. And in classic Jackson fashion, he modestly asserted that his old brigade was more deserving of the name Stonewall than he was because they were the ones who truly earned it. Now there's many variations on this story and whether it's true or not, the fact remains that if Jackson's brigade had turned tail and run from the Union at First Bull Run, there would probably be no famous Stonewall Jackson, no famous Stonewall Brigade, and I certainly wouldn't be here giving this presentation. The Stonewall Brigade stands, stands out in our, <clears throat> excuse me, in our collective memory as one of the most famous fighting units of the Civil War. But why has it earned such a legendary status and how has that memory changed over time? I chose to focus my research on how the brigade has been remembered by historians over time, tracking the historiography from the immediate post-war period through to more contemporary historians. I narrowed my research further to, by focusing on Jackson's Valley Campaign of 1862. I felt this was appropriate because for the Stonewall Brigade, the Valley Campaign was a very personal conflict. This, after all, was their homes. The units that made up the brigade, the 2nd, 4th, 5th, 27th, and 33rd Virginia Infantry, came from the valley. They came from places like Winchester, Harrisonburg, Lexington, and Augusta County. As they dashed from victory to victory, moving up and down the valley at a seemingly inhuman pace, they were using roads they had traveled all their lives, fighting in fields they worked with their own hands, and in, in the same woods where their fathers and grandfathers had taught them how to hunt. While many people tend to think of the Stonewall Brigade as the penultimate fighting force, absent of any flaw, historians have reevaluated the unit throughout the years and have been able to take off those rose-colored glasses that legend would have us view them through. The Stonewall Brigade, once uh, regarded as nearly as immortal as its first commander, has been reevaluated through the years, and while historians re still regard the brigade as one of the finest fighting units of the war, more current research has shed light on evidence that proves these brave men were not the invincible fighting force that the legend depicts. Now, the Stonewall Brigade gained much of its fame in part due to its service record, but it also owes much of its fame to the infamous Lost Cause movement. The Lost Cause resulted in the veneration of Confederate heroes in the minds and writings of Southern novelists, historians, journalists, and citizens in the years immediately after the war. Figures such as Stonewall Jackson and Robert E. Lee and other uh, famous generals balloon from mere men to heroes of titanic proportions. Uh, the writings of John Esten Cook provide us with evidence of such attitudes. Though we may not meet the credentials of other historians and we may find his historical methods to be lacking, Cook's writings do provide us with one of the first analyses of the Stonewall Brigade's action in the Valley Campaign. Uh, Cook, while serving with Jeb Stuart, wrote essays and articles that were published throughout the South during and after the war. 
his writings, along with those of many Southern journalists that followed conf the Confederate armies on their campaigns, gave the public the first glimpses of Jackson and his men. In many ways, Cook deserves a good deal of credit for making Jackson so famous across the South and so greatly feared in the North during the war. Though he did not serve directly with Jackson or the brigade in the Valley, Cook encountered both while serving on Stuart's staff. Of the Stonewall Brigade, Cook writes the following. The old, the old Stonewall Brigade is ready. Here is the answer to the roll call along the line. And though the eye is dull from want of food and rest, the arm is strong and the bayonet is sharp and bright. Before those bayonets, no foe shall stand. To pass them is to advance over the bodies of dead heroes, grasping still the trusty musket, even in death. Now, this is just a sample that is, is exemplary of most of Cook's writing on the brigade and its gallantry in the valley. Um, it, it comes across as very superfluous. You know, it's, it, you could even describe it as gaudy. It drips of the notions of Southern exceptionalism that made the country so divided during the war and so hard to put back together afterwards. Post-war Confederate historians hold up the Stonewall Brigade as the finest example of the Southern soldier, ranking among the greatest fighting units in history. Cook puts the brigade up there with the 10th Legion of Caesar and the old guard of Napoleon, Napoleon having made its name forever famous to all tide of time. The Stonewall Brigade was a hard fighting unit, especially during the Valley Campaign. But as time, as time passed and we get further and further away from the war, we begin to see historians unraveling this mythos surrounding the unit and instead examine them more accurately. Time would eventually reveal them to be a group of men just as flawed as the next. Now, over a century after the Stonewall Brigade dashed up and down the Shenandoah, a historian who would become one of the most well-known and well-respected in the field offered his analysis of the Stonewall Brigade service record. James I. Robertson Jr. offered perhaps the first major work that focused on the Stonewall Brigade instead of Stonewall the Man. While Robertson concurs to a degree with Cook's assessment of the Brigade's bravery and fighting spirit, he departs from Cook's narrative in the honest evaluation of the Brigade's shortcomings as well as its successes. Robertson writes that, had it, that the brigade had its share of cowards, deserters, and stragglers. It was an exceptional brigade, but by no means a perfect one. Gone are the titans and legends that Cook wrote about, replaced by Robertson's more sober recounting of common soldiers defending their homeland against what they saw as foreign invaders. Robertson is still able to laud upon them the military praise that they deserve, but he does so in a manner that's not overly extravagant. The achievements of the Stonewall Brigade and Jackson's army as a whole during the Valley Campaign are feats of military brilliance deserving of honor and praise. Their actions were not perfect though. Perhaps the most, the, the most notable blemish of the campaign is the first battle of Kernstown in March of 1862. With Jackson being promoted to Lieutenant General, command of the Stonewall Brigade fell to Brigadier General Richard Garnett and it was under his leadership that the brigade fought at Kernstown. Robertson writes that at the height of battle, Garnett had reached a crisis. Many of his companies were lying helpless on the ground, their ammunition expended. The Stonewall Brigade was shattered and utterly fatigued. Bluecoats were in possession were, were in a position to assault its front and both flanks. It was senseless to continue and suicidal to remain. This isn't the gallant tale of Jackson's foot cavalry dashing in to sweep through the Yankees at the perfect moment, carrying the day for the Confederacy. This is a very real moment of men who marched all day, rushed into battle without food or rest, and were slaughtered by numerically superior Union force. The brigade had been placed in the hottest part of battle, a customary Jackson move, else he'd be accused of giving his old brigade any special treatment. The Stonewall Brigade rushed into battle bravely and was met with heavy opposition. Naturally, Garnett chose to withdraw and reform his brigade, and this ended up being a choice that would get Garnett court-martialed by Jackson and very nearly executed. Robertson doesn't write all this to impugn Garnett's legacy for not being the Brigadier Jackson was. He writes this as a very sound analysis of the first battle of Kernstown, a battle where Jackson's tactics did not work and the Stonewall Brigade suffered heavy casualties without achieving their mission. Jackson lost, plain and simple, and the, brigade, and the Stonewall Brigade paid dearly for his mistakes. Now, moving 30 years forward into the 1990s, we see a number of additions to the historiography of the Stonewall Brigade. 
Um, the three historians from the period I chose to focus on are Robert G. Tanner, Robert K. Crick, and Jeffrey D. Wirt. Uh, these three stand out because together their works show how st historical opinion has progressed during that decade. Uh, first, I'll start with Tanner's work. Uh, it, it looks at Jackson's Valley campaign as a whole, and his writing, like Robertson, adequately points out that the Stonewall points out the Stonewall Brigade's faults and shortcomings. But as a whole, the work it tends to feel a bit dated. It seems to look backwards and not forward. Tanner offers a good historical an analysis, and it's a very informative work. But it doesn't really offer anything new to the historiography. It seems like a recapitulation of what has come before it rather than moving historiography forward. Crick's work, unlike Tanner's, does feel like it, it makes some more progress. He offers an in-depth evaluation of the Battle of Port Republic, perhaps the greatest victory of the Valley Campaign. Crick's work is significant because he identified a relationship that existed in Jackson's army that was often a key ingredient to its success. Jackson gave the Stonewall Brigade the tough missions oftentimes being the first unit to assault the enemy, and then send in General Richard Taylor's brigade of Louisiana troops to deliver the critical blow in the most dire hour and secure the day's victory. Both units were tough fighters and their ranks filled with battle-hardened veterans, but both were still mortal. Crick still maintains that the more sobering analysis of the Stonewall Brigade, but he builds on the summation by, by proving it on a hyper-specific level. And then just before the turn of the century in 1999, another entry is added to the historiography. And this one forgoes Jackson altogether and instead focuses on the common soldiers. This of course is, is the work of Jeffrey D. Wirt. Uh, Wirt delves into the experience of the common soldier and a comparative history between the Stonewall Brigade and the Iron Brigade. Wirt's work is off, is off. Wirt's work offered a big step forward in the historiography because it's an account of the war that draws back much of the legends that surround large military figures and becomes more intimate and more personal. This was a perspective that hadn't yet been examined when it came to the Stonewall Brigade. Exhaustive volumes have been written about Jackson and the Valley Campaign and the great military achievements of the Stonewall Brigade, but very little had been written about the ordinary soldiers. Wirt's work is essential to our understanding of the brigade tracing the Valley Campaign through the eyes of the common private instead of the eccentric general who planned it. Here's just one example. Wirt offers these, root, these words from Lieutenant Colonel Lawson Botts of the 2nd Virginia Infantry. The men are much fatigued by the constant marches they have recently made. This loss of rest followed by a forced march tomorrow would so exhaust them as to hazard the hard earned reputation of the regiment. It's because of this exhaustion, Wirt later tells us in his book that the 2nd Virginia and the rest of the Stonewall Brigade were spared from fighting at Front Royal on, on May 23rd, 1862, and they were posted in a reserve position. Being stationed at the back is, is not a, a, a position we're accustomed to seeing the Stonewall Brigade in. We're used to seeing in the, the thick of battle, but there's no shame in acknowledging that they had to be posted on the rear because they were tired. Jackson had just been reinforced by a fresh division under General Ewell prior to Front Royal, so it would make every bit of tactical sense that Jackson would send in his fresh troops and leave his weary ones in the rear if practicable. After all, it would just be two short days later that the Stonewall Brigade would resume its position at the head of the Confederate assault at the First Battle of Winchester. Wirt writes that shortly after daybreak, the Stonewall Brigade advanced, scattered the enemy skirmishers from a ridge, and then met a wall of fire from the main Union line. The Virginians clung to the positions as federal volleys and cannon fire seared the ground. Two days after getting some much-needed rest, the Stonewall Brigade is back in the thick of it, leading the charge against a well-defended federal position. But their valor at Winchester shouldn't be seen as a redemption from Front Royal. There's no shame in the occasional rear guard duty. As historians have surmised over the years, these are obviously men that fill the ranks of the Stonewall Brigade, not mythical warriors some of the his early historiography would have us believe they are. They were men, men with human limitations, exceptional in their skill and bravery, but by no means perfect or mechanical. They were men fighting and dying for their homeland, and it would be a disservice to their memory to remember them as anything else. Now, to conclude my presentation today, I want to shift gears just for a moment here and 
most of my, all of my research for this paper focused on how historians have remembered the Stonewall Brigade up to now. But I think we also need to acknowledge that we can't let our analyses of these men end here. We need to come back and keep revisiting these men. There's still lots of room for more analyses to be written, like with Wirt's book. It's new and fresh and interesting, but at the same time, it's 21 years old. There's so much more that can be written about the, these men, the common soldiers, like Private Kurtz and Major Wolf and Private Cowley and the other men you see on your screen right now. What is their story? That's where the work's left to be done, I think. At a time in our country when many are questioning what the legacy of the Civil War is, now more than ever, we need to push forward and peel back the legends and myths that still live in our collective memories and take a hard look at who these men were, brave, flawed Americans. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Um, yeah, go ahead and close out your screen there. All right. Um, so I'll offer a few uh, comments here about the papers, some collective papers, um, and then um, I will uh, summarize and raise some questions and comments. Um, so first off here, Thomas reminds us that Indiana and Illinois uh, were linchpins to Lincoln's presidential election. Obviously, Lincoln eked out uh, a majority in these swing states for a variety of reasons. Uh, yes, he points out that Lincoln was a native son uh, and had a moderate approach on slavery, but Thomas points to two factors that may have tipped the balance uh, toward Abe Lincoln. That honest Abe was a moniker that worked thanks to a growing belief that the Democrats were indeed uh, corrupt or incompetent um, in terms of the outgoing administration. Um, also, the fact that Republican policies made good sense to Midwesterners, that a lot of what the Democrats had to offer um, really didn't have a, didn't hit home here in the Midwest. Um, historians have noted the way in which Republicans' free labor ideology with its economic rather than moral critique of slavery appealed wild, widely to Northern whites, especially here in the Midwest. The new twist here is especially, and I'd like to even see or hear more about this, uh, is about the real suffering of Midwestern farmers as they struggled to profit from their grain crops in the wake of the Panic of 1857. A couple of ways or directions I can see uh, this paper um, heading out uh, from here, uh, this big questions are raised. One, I wondered um, how did this, the fact that this election between Douglas and Lincoln, which is really the main crux of the campaign in Illinois, the fact that it was a repeat in 1860 from 1858, how did that impact the local dynamics? Um, in other words, I think folks in Illinois had already seen this before. Um, I wondered if there, you had any background or experience in the books that you had been working on here about how that shaped um, the election in this important swing state of Illinois um, in particular, because this would have all ha gone down in 1858 too. The other part of it I wondered about was um, motivation at the polls, right? So part of this is you uh, persuasively suggest and the historians you study persuasively suggest um, about the buy-in with the Republican Party in Lincoln, that his message mattered. Um, but part of it I also wondered was that uh, Douglas, of course, used the fear of race and the uh, specter of racism, right, to sell his policies, the specter of fear. Um, he called the Republicans the Black Republicans, and in spite of uh, the fact that Lincoln was a moderate, tried to cast him as an abolitionist, um, and that there would be this racial um, equality that was soon to befall um, Illinois if Lincoln was elected. And so I wondered um, really broadly here, sort of how did fear um, shape and motivate um, elections as well as uh, the rational elements, the economic interests that you highlight as well. All right, and then we had Caitlin going second, doing our study on uh, George McClellan and some of the different um, uh, interpretations there. Uh, clearly, uh, he has not gotten good press, at least not since the 1950s, it looks like. Um, he needs some help um, along the way. I'm sure somebody's gonna be out there to help him out a little bit. Um, but it clearly at the heart of this argument of what these historians um, have argued is that um, McClellan was full of himself. He had a lot of hubris, right? He was very arrogant, convinced he could do no wrong, uh, he ended up making a lot of mistakes along the way. Um, we also see, and I, what I like about Caitlin's paper, she shows how that arrogance um, really created a prickliness. And then it also then fed into this uh, lack of relationships uh, with people around him seemingly so that he couldn't make um, good decisions, couldn't handle feedback and wasn't able to move in a positive direction. Uh, so with your convincing and brief biography, Caitlin, um, I guess my first question is, how did it get this bad? I mean, obviously, McClellan was very successful before this. Um, he was kind of a superstar um, in the military in the 1850s. Um, and so I was wondering, um, 
you know, what, you know, what was the military culture like? In other words, um, obviously people saw a lot in him. Uh, what were some of those skills? And you mentioned a little bit, the one scholar who talked about his organizational abilities, uh, but I'm wondering, you know, what were his um, strengths and what does that maybe open up about um, military training, military culture, and the values that they celebrated in, in the 1850s um, and into the Civil War? I also wanted to know um, how politics played out in your studies here, uh, because one of the things we know about McClellan, uh, you know, roughly here is that he was a thoroughgoing Democrat. And so one of the reasons why he had such a poor relationship with Lincoln uh, and many in his uh, cabinet is because of his um, political ideology and how that shaped him. Um, I also wondered how this might shape his uh, battlefield dynamics uh, here as well. Um, clearly, there's a huge rupture um, after Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation, as well as the um, qualified victory at, at Antietam um, here for McClellan. So this is going to be the end of the road, but it's as much political and ideological as it is uh, military. It's, it's sort of both of those working together. And I also wondered how um, politics shaped uh, officer corps and what that looked like. All right, last not, but not least, uh, we have Jake Biller. Um, he shows that no one and no group is perfect, even the legendary Stonewall Brigade um, and their work here. Um, he does a great job of separating myth from fact, and we see that beginning to unfold um, in the historical literature here that he's citing. Um, he pulls back the curtain um, and tells us a lot more about this unit than what we knew before. Um, what it turns out is that, yes, they were pretty remarkable or impressive, but they also need to be bailed out at times by other Confederate unions, uh, units. Um, sometimes they needed rest. Um, the big takeaway I took from this was that no fighting unit fights alone um, in the context of the Civil War. My only quibble with Jake's paper, and this is my biggest quibble, quibble with all the papers, is when you, uh, you claimed in your paper that marching 70 miles with gear in four days was no great feat. My arthritic knees disagree violently with you, but um, I was impressed by that, even if you thought that was an ordinary accomplishment. But on a deeper level, um, some other things that came up here. Um, I wondered about the sort of home turf argument, right? You make a case that these are local men, uh, that they came from this area in the valley in which they were fighting. And that's a huge, um, and we see this uh, repeatedly on the Southern side of things, right? That home field advantage, quite literally of knowing the geography, the people and what's happening. I also wondered if you saw any evidence in the scholarship you read about it being a potential weakness. Um, in other words, um, soldiers want companionship, families, they want, um, uh, their families at home need money or they need labor for crops or things like that. Was there ever um, any time, especially as things progressed um, or hardships progressed, um, where being on home turf could be, um, maybe a liability is too strong a word, but be a challenge um, as well as a strength. Um, the second thing I wondered uh, from Jake was uh, what makes a great Civil War fighting unit? Uh, in your work, um, you cite some additional books where there have been comparative studies with, say, the Iron Brigade from the Union. And so we see here that this included, of course, uh, Hoosier troops. Um, and so I wondered what seemed to be the sort of universal or whatever the commonalities, the hallmarks uh, from North and South that made for a really successful fighting unit here, a brigade that seemed to be able to be thrown into anything and, and do things. Yes, maybe uh, we've exaggerated uh, the success of the Stonewall Brigade, but clearly they were a very viable um, and successful fighting unit. What, what are the key elements there? And the final question, I guess, I wonder about um, this unit, um, especially if we were to persist beyond 1862, would be um, how much fighting can a unit take, right? What's the point of exhaustion? Um, I know that in the 20th century, the military began to do, uh, say in World War II, uh, combined scientific, more scientific approaches to sort of assess uh, what, um, how many engagements, how much marching, how much of this and that, you know, could a unit take? Uh, and I wonder if you began to see strains or signs of, of stress and strain um, here um, in this unit. So those are my quick summary um, and questions. Uh, I've got a couple things that I just want to highlight here. Uh, one is um, I want to emphasize how these students are doing the, the work of historians. What we see first and foremostly is they're doing a fantastic job of looking at multiple variables. Um, in Thomas's paper, for instance, we see something as concrete as economic self-interest, but we also see softer values about trust, uh, right, um, in terms of Lincoln and what's going on, and this created a very powerful uh, message. Second thing I see here is multiple perspectives. Uh, we see not only generals and presidents, but also privates and sergeants, where Caitlin reveals the flaws of a top commander. Jake offers us a view from the ranks of the ordinary soldiers from the bottom up. Uh, we see a lot of efforts here to dig below the rhetoric and the myth. 
partly that's done by historians and good scholars, but partly that's done by our students here. We see this, um, especially with John Cook um, in the uh, paper by Jake, uh, talking about how this myth was really being constructed you know, almost during the war. Um, and the final thing is that as these students explore historiography, they're showing that history is never quite settled. And Jake did a great job of bringing that point home um, in his conclusion about we uh, remarkably are still finding new sources, but also new interpretations. Uh, and I think that we have a lot to contribute um, and that conversation continues as it does today. The final thing um, I wanna mention here is sort of why the Civil War is still sort of opening up and, and sort of where we're headed here. Um, a few things uh, that, that stand out to me. Um, these students have analyzed the interplay of strategy and tactics in both politics and war. Thomas shows us Republicans and Lincoln knew how to craft a winning political strategy, even if their military tactics struggled. They also show how this event hinged on popular mobilization of both political parties and military forces. We need to grasp why the hallmark of the nation compromise could no longer be had in 1861. These papers cause us to ponder how leadership works best in a democracy from both failures and successes. And finally, while our papers here focus on the two, first two years of the war, we know that Lincoln would face one more campaign, his 1864 presidential reelection bid. And here, of course, he would face McClellan. Remarkably, even in the midst of so much suffering and political wrangling, the election in the North would end peacefully with the log splitter winning one last time. All right. Um, at this point, what we do, it looks like we're loaded up with um, lots of questions from the Q&A. So um, what I'll do is I'll share those um, with our audience. Um, all right. Um, for uh, Thomas, we now emphasize the importance of slavery to the 1860 election. Would you agree that non-slavery economic issues, including the Homestead Act, the Transcontinental Railroad, and the Depression were what really determined the election's result? Uh, I would say yes, especially for those states in court. Well, because like my one of my main points is that the election is ultimately determined by the states of Indiana and Illinois. And these states, I think, do care about slavery and some of the things that go along with it. There's some other questions that I'm scrolling down that will sort, sort of relate to the idea that things that go along with slavery are definitely at play. Like people in Indiana and Illinois, they dislike the arrogance of the Southern states. They dislike the power that the Southern states or that they perceive the Southern states have over governance and things like that. So that does have, to, and they certainly don't like that they feel that Southern interests are being appeased. They don't want to have to you know, enforce the Fugitive Slave Act, for example. So these are not people who are radical abolitionists, but it's like with any other issue that people aren't gonna be happy when some outsider comes in and bosses you around and makes you help out with, some, with something that you think is only going to help them. But for a place like Indiana or Illinois, I would say those other issues are certainly things that are going to put it over the top. And I think that those issues are, at the end of the day, things that are somewhat unescapable. Because you look at, say, 1856, a lot of the same problems with slavery were still there. They still had the Fugitive Slave Act, which was unpopular. They still had the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which was unpopular in these northern states. But that wasn't enough to sweep the North, even with the unpopularity of those things. It took, I think, the incompetence of the Buchanan administration and the lack, frankly, the neglect of the Democratic Party of these regions for them to then switch over to the new Republican Party. Okay, super. Um, a question for sort of everybody here. Um, and especially we'll, we'll start with uh, Caitlin and Jake, um, with all your topics, um, you have enormously well-known figures, libraries have been written on all these topics, like much of the Civil War. Um, how did you um, gather your evidence? I mean, what were the um, determining factors as you uh, tried to narrow down the uh, works of history in your particular area? Um, and I guess the, the other part I'll just tack on to this is, was there anything that really struck you as a successful work that you would recommend, say, to a fellow student if they wanted to know more about the Civil War that was in this collection that you read? Caitlin, why don't you go first? So for me, I, I used primarily just books. And how I did that was um, I was in the library and 
I pulled up Google Books to find, to, like, kind of help refine what I was looking for exactly. So I wasn't just thumbing through several books. Um, and so when I found like something that had the keyword of what I was looking for, I would um, find that book on the shelf and then just um, read through it to see if I could find what if something that would be applicable to what I was researching. Um, I don't think I used any articles or anything like that for this paper though. Super. Uh, Jake, how about you? I mean, obviously similar thing here. I mean, you've narrowed a little bit from Stonewall to Stonewall's Brigade, but even then there's mountains of literature uh, that would be uh, available here. Uh, what were some of the, the criteria that you were using to narrow that field down? And um, I, I get a sense of which one you like best, but go ahead and, and tell us uh, what you thought there. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I guess you could say my, my research really started with um, James Robertson's uh, The Stonewall Brigade uh, written in uh, 19, it came out in 1962. Uh, that was actually one bef even before I started the class I had in my personal collection and I had read. Um, and it really, it, it's kind of jumped out at me as, as, you know, one of the better um, military histories of the Civil War that I had read. And I found it interesting, like, re that they refined it, not just to Jackson, but actually the brigade itself. And that, I guess you could say, kind of spurred my interest to to examine how how the brigade has been interpreted by other historians um so i robertson's book was definitely my jumping off point um i wanted to make sure i went back as early as i could that's how i came up with um cook's book uh, i came up with that just because i wanted to get i, I knew there was i knew there would be literature from the immediate post-war period and you know cook writes some of his stuff actually during the war and so i i wanted to see what that initial kind of that initial opinion and that initial uh memory of what the stonewall brigade was and how we started kind of forming um the legend of stonewall um and then i also wanted to move as far forward as i could uh, close to um recent history um, uh, my last three books, um, uh, Robert G. Tanner's Stonewall in the Valley, um, Crick's book about Port Republic, and then Jeffrey D. Wirt's comparative between um, the Stonewall Brigade and the Iron Brigade. Um, Wirt's book really jumped out at me because, uh, it, like, I, like I point out, it forgoes kind of, let's get Jackson out of the picture. Let's focus on, you know, who these men were and how not just analyzing the Stonewall Brigade, but also seeing the commonalities between, you know, the Stonewall Brigade and the Iron Brigade. I know I didn't bring it up in this paper, but it, it makes a really good, um, it does a really good job of, of drawing comparisons between the two and seeing where they, where they're similar, but also, you know, kind of where they contrast from each other. Um, so that was kind of my approach. I wanted to make sure I got a wide, you know, variety of literature just because obviously, you know, it, it's been so long since the civil war and i knew i knew i could find early enough stuff and i felt like to make a good historiography argument that i needed to you know spread out where my uh, the times where my sources were from okay and how about you thomas what are you, are you again well, no me, shortage. Uh, <laughs> i in in one word i'd just say data when you're looking at elections that's the very nice thing about researching elections and politics is that for so much of it, you can cut through the, the fat and just look at, okay, vote totals, convention votes, platform. There's, we're, in history, we a lot of the times shy away from, from numbers <laughs> and from having to do math and things like that. But for this research, things like that were very useful, especially to help get to the point quickly. Great, and I, I loved in your presentation today, your connection to sort of modern day lingo and some of the ways we, we talk about politics and so forth today uh, to connect to that period as well. Um, one question, I see it coming up in a couple of different ways here. Um, and I think this will start with Caitlin probably, and then we can sort of um, wind it out a little bit. But part of it um, is that folks are asking about then and now. In other words, um, Caitlin, you've offered a, a pretty, um, a, a tough view here of McClellan, which is sort of the par for the course these days, not too shocking. But in his own time, right, um, he obviously um, 
as Dr. Edgerson points out, was fairly popular among his own troops. So um, first off would be sort of, why do you think, I mean, we look back at him and we see all his foibles and failures. Um, what was it about him that would have made him um, a success with his own men, uh, potentially sort of beyond your communications emphasis here? And then the second part is um, why he would have been, uh, and maybe, you know, Thomas isn't actually the 1860 election, but we'll, we'll fast forward to 1864. But this broader question of what makes somebody popular and the Democrats in particular, what their message was um, here. In other words, why was he able to have a popular following, um, especially if he was seen um, as a bad goat, not the great goat, not the greatest of all time? Um, it, you know, sort of when, well, how does this deal, right? I mean, so we're using our hindsight um, in his own time during the course of the Civil War. Um, what we're what we're seeing is a strength even after we say is all done and finished after 1862 but clearly there was a lot more there so uh caitlin i'll let you respond um thomas if you want to uh, add something then after that would be great um so as far as like mcclellan and him being popular among his troops he i think his biggest fault was how like indecisive he was like if he would have just had the guts to do what was needed to be done rather than underestimating himself like they would have done so well <laughs> throughout the war um and i did before he was um chosen as um the commander as for the army he was singled out because he was um, training troops in ohio and so um even as like his time as commander, like he was again known for his organizational techniques. So him um, training and organizing his troops, even even though he wasn't um, gung ho about making the first move. Um, and like for the democratic question, he he had very different views than what um, I think most people the Republic Party at that time had, he did not agree with um, the slavery issue. He thought, um, he just, he was not a fan of what Lincoln was proposing, like as the Emancipa Emancipation Proclamation and like even the South was like before he was commanding, like trying to get him to come to their side to lead. But for the Democratic him running for the Democratic position, um, he did promise to, you know, bring the Union back to its glory. And I think it kind of goes full circle as it made President Lincoln look bad that um, McClellan wasn't attacking and wasn't bringing in victories for the North. And because he was making Lincoln look bad, it just kind of circled into, well, I can do better, so I'm going to run for president. So it's just kind of like the circle of, yeah, he's doing bad, but I can do better, even though if I were to do better now, we wouldn't have the issues that we're having, if, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, Th Thomas, why don't you go ahead and pick up if you have any other thoughts you want to add? I guess um, that was covered very well. And obviously, I know less about 1864, at least a little. But I think definitely that idea of indecisiveness with McClellan in his uh, military career is a very common theme for the Democratic Party as a whole in this era because they're the ones trying to sort of appeal to the North and South. People, you know, ragged on the Republican Party for being a regional party, but let's be honest, it basically was. They were not really making an appeal to the Southern states, so they didn't have to deal with the contradictions that the Union still contained. The Democratic Party did, and even by 1864, they were still sort of trying to play both sides. So I think that that theme of indecisiveness stretches very far and wide between McClellan and his party. Right, and, and I'd add too, I mean, obviously there's the course of the war, right? So uh, the Eastern theater, uh, partly because of McClellan, but other force, uh, factors too, right, um, are showing that it's uh, no um, easy process there. And so those ongoing struggles militarily, and I think also, um, Clearly, the, some of the, the legacies of uh, the Stephen Douglas and other earlier campaigns about race and, and North um, has some, some real power to it, some real staying power, um, as does the, possibly the sort of emphasis that McClellan had on law and order, right, that he thought that Lincoln had gone too far uh, with some of his um, actions. Um, 
All right. Um, the other question, which I saw here, uh, which was uh, for Jake, so I want to pull you in here, Jake, um, was how important do you think the lost cause was not just in advancing the legend of Stonewall Jackson and his brigade, but in, cre in creating the belief that the South overall was militarily better than the North? In other words, can you take this um, example, this really rich example, and sort of broaden it out to talk about the supposed military superiority of uh, Southern forces? Yeah, I think... I, I guess the easiest way I, I can see to put it is I think the lost cause tries to build up the military success, especially the early military successes of the Confederacy, um, trying to find something to be proud of, something they can hold on to, something to say that you might have won the war, but we're not going to quit. And I think, you know, it that becomes kind of the common narrative that most people think of as the South is militarily better because the, the North doesn't have a lot of success in the East early. And the East was where, you know, you had all your major cities were in the East minus Chicago. Um, and so that's where Washington is. That's where really the whole, I guess the whole country was kind of focused was on the war in the East and the union doesn't have a lot of success early on and the Confederates do now, whether that's the union just started with bad commanders and it took them a while to, you know, get everything in gear or whether the, the South, you know, does have better commanders. I think it's, I don't know. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's, they're trying to find something to hold on to as far as like something to hold their head up heads up after the war but i think they blow it way out of proportion uh, obviously as i made the argument um in the presentation so it's um i don't know and i also think that the argument gets totally swayed to the the south being better militarily because you don't see you don't in the post-war period you don't see people in the north really challenging that argument a lot there, there's there's no northern equivalent really to the lost cause if you will they kind of just let it go and so whether it's true or not enough times you you hear a story you start to believe it's true and so i think you know the fact that the that people in the north in the in the immediate post-war period don't challenge it and want to just kind of move on from the war i think is why the lost cause gained so much traction and became you know such a dominant um dominant idea in uh immediate post-war historiography yeah i think uh, part of this too is that if how do you explain loss right i mean if you're on the losing side you have to come up with a Good and it, and so I think for the South it was to say it was a valiant loss and part of that really hinged on uh, we never had a fair shot right we had so uh, we didn't have nearly the iron the North had we didn't have the industrial capacity we didn't have the troops we didn't you know but as you're pointing out there were lots of advantages that the Confederates had like fighting on their home turf not having long supply lines things that historians would point to now uh, that would give them a, a pretty significant counterbalance uh, to some of those northern advantages but. I think some of that was lost um, in those initial treatments. I mean, the other thing that's happened, especially in the last oh, you know, 30 years or so, has been a shift away from that Eastern theater to the Western theater. And of course, when that happens, then we start see, seeing people like Sherman or Grant, um, and it's a different part of that coin, right? It's, it's the union side of success. And then it begins like, well, wait a minute, what about Braxton Bragg or you know, a bunch of um, other folks on the Confederate side? Um, that don't seem to be uh, too effective in the field. So that's also how that calculus has, has really been shifting um, here in uh, the not too distant past. Very good. Um, all right, and let's see. Uh, Thomas, we had another question, uh, I think from Dr. Etchison here, uh, that in the uh, 1860 election, so we're gonna bring it back to where your research was, um, she raises the hypothetical, which is a very good one. Why do you think uh, the South didn't just rally around Stephen Douglas um, and say, hey, we can win the national election, right? Um, what, what's, what's your thought on the, obviously the split would happen um, within the Democratic Party to a Southern and Northern wing. Uh, why were those Southerners so obstinate and not willing to um, compromise a bit? Well, I, when you look at the 
southern states in 1860. They're, they're not exactly rational actors. These are the people who outright secede from the union because, the, because a candidate they don't like wins an election, not even full control of Congress, just, just the executive is enough for them to leave the union. And there's good factions of people in these states who already want to. So I think you see by 1860 that there is a great deal of, you can't really rationalize it because it's kind of an irrational action. They're really only objection to Stephen Douglas is that he is still holding on to the idea of popular sovereignty in the territories, even though that was no longer a practicable thing. He's still holding on to that because as the good politician he is, he knows that's the only way you can still appeal to the North on this issue. And that's just completely unacceptable to the South. They see by 1860 that the I think they see that the tides are beginning to turn against them and they are demanding explicit support for slavery at this point or or they think that they and their way of life are going to be doomed so i think you see objectively yeah it's it's irrational they should have just not uh rallied behind douglas and they would have had a good chance but they weren't acting rationally and they were very much activating under an, an all or nothing uh, ideology. Super, all right. Um, uh, one uh, question, especially for the other two of you, uh, Caitlin and Jake, um, I raised this sort of question in different ways um, in my comments, but um, what really made for this, um, if you had two or three of the, the ingredients for the secret sauce of a, an exceptional fighting unit, so we touched on it in different ways here, but um, what seemed to be, I mean, whether it's from top down or bottom up, um, what what do you think, um, you know, seems to suggest uh, more, you know, beyond sort of being able to defend hearth and home, um, what, what do you think, um, any, any variables, any suggestions um, on that front? I can, I can jump in here first. Um, I think I think one of the biggest keys to success is, you know, having cohesion within the unit, you know, having, you know, I looking at a brigade, you know, having your regiments being able to work together, you know, having cohesion and then going down from the regiment level to your companies, having, you know, a common unity and not having, you know, you see in some in in some units, you know, you have, you know, a company or a, a regiment that's kind of uh, the ugly duckling uh, of the family, if you will. And it's, it, it seems to kind of weigh the rest of uh, the unit down. But I, I, I think cohesion is, is a big thing and, and having kind of, you know, a common understanding. Um, I also think like, being able to to trust uh have trust in your subordinates is key from a command level you know not having not having the brigade commander have to micromanage what the colonels are doing what the colonels have to micromanage what the majors are doing and so on and so forth you know you you, you trust that you've trained and prepared to this point that when you get into battle you trust the people in command that they're going to make you know the right decisions at the right time um what else could I say? We can go to, to Caitlin yeah. here. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of Caitlin, since you're on the sort of managerial side down, right? If, um, and some, Jake, you were covering sort of both sides of this. Um, but is there any, any um, sense of, um, you know, I guess part of my question to you would be, can we broaden the blame? Can we cast a wider net uh, so that uh, McClellan seems to be um, the straw man here in some ways, um, and we uh, are going to point our finger at him as uh, second guessing himself or ultimately being too confident at the same time. Um, but I'm also wondering, you know, who, you know, could we also suggest that it's the people he surrounds himself with? Um, but but what, what do you see, Caitlin, anything that in terms of what made him ineffective that could tell us something about what makes for an effective civil war leader? Um, well, I agree with Jake, like cohesion is a big portion of what I guess would make them run um, better. Um, and along with that kind of goes like respect, like it's 
to have someone who doesn't necessarily respect President Lincoln, like control, um, like being in charge of the army, like how are you going to get other people to respect that? Which kind of going back to like that whole democratic um, where he ran for president, like if you, it's hard to just have like a following of people respect you if you're not um, being respected by those beneath you as far as like President Lincoln goes. Um, and I also think just like, it's very basic, but like stepping into like the leadership role um, as far as like McClellan goes, he did do great things with um, his troops and like training them and organizing um, with different like military techniques. But as far as um, implementing and like taking the initiative to like actually follow his battle plans and to, um, I guess, attack the South, um, it must have been frustrating for his troops. So it's I mean, because th that's what they're there for, was to fight. And if you're not being sent out to do that, that's got to be frustrating. So just having like an understanding of um, what your troops are there for, what you're there to do. And again, just like the cohesiveness and being respectful. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think one of the real challenges here is that these are um, in a sense, sort of democratic armies. Um, these are the, at least the men, like the Stonewall Brigade, who are doing the bulk of the fighting and dying um, are largely volunteers. Uh, so yes, there are gonna be uh, drafts on both sides, uh, but those are men who are really in, in some ways in this war on the, on the margins of the fighting. And so um, a lot of historians have tried to sort of untangle, you know, what are the implications um, of this huge political debate followed by this huge or military mobilization. And what does that mean in terms of leadership? And you guys are all, you're both um, sort of hitting on this of, of sort of how do you create that cohesion respect? On one hand, um, these soldiers are not professionals for the most part, right? Very tiny percentage are, are actually you know, professional in any way, shape or form. Um, so then it becomes this question of how do they get mobilized? How do they fight? And yes, there are men who leave the ranks for all kinds of reasons, but Overall, it's, it's pretty remarkable, especially given the um, phenomenal uh, losses here of life in some of these units and battles that they, they persist um, over the course of the war. So um, it's an intriguing uh, question about how a, a democratic uh, society goes to war, a civil war, no less, and how that uh, proceeds. Um, any other, do you guys, uh, do you all want to ask any questions of each other? Um, or address any of the concerns that uh, are not concerns, but any of the questions that that I raised in my commentary, um, feel free. We've still got um, a few more minutes here. Anybody? All right. I don't, any other questions? Um, I think we've hit most of the Q&A questions, which I greatly appreciate. Uh, Professor Etchison's uh, definitely been busy uh, typing for us here. Um, we've got a few other good ones too, but I think we've tackled most of them. Um, if you all could pick a primary source, right? So if you were to go do um, research um, on this, whether it was elections, commanders, um, what uh, would you, what would be your your dream source and what will primary source um, here, and what would you hope to to find in that uh, those materials? We'll finish with that. I, I guess for me, studying an election, I mentioned that you don't need, you know, the high strung modern analytics that we have for things to understand the trends back then, but I'd still like to see them. <laughs> I still would enjoy accurate exit polling based on every age and demographic and location and things like that. I still would like to have that. So if I could have that. Uh, so that, that would be my dream source if I was studying uh, a 19th century election. Fantastic. Caitlin, what, how about you? Since we'll just go in the order in which you present. Um, for me, I would just love to read like the letters, whether they were whoever they were between either McClellan and Lincoln or Lincoln and the administration or McClellan and his wife. They just seem very petty. And I think that would be interesting to um, just read through those. Yeah, to see the, the private side, the personal, at least a little more personal side um, here in terms of uh, rather than the public figure. All right, and Jake, how about you? Um, I think uh, 
for my uh, my paper, the the dream source is you know the 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 journals, the personal letters of you know the the common privates, if you will, the sergeants, the 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 common foot soldiers. Um, you know, we don't we we don't always have those just because you know people doesn't don't save those every year. We've lo- they get lost, you know, as history goes on, um, and also. You have to remember that, you know, some of these, you know, poor farmers don't always know how to read and write. Um, so you don't get that written account. You have, you know, oral accounts that may or may not have been written down accurately at some point. Um, so as, as I'm making, you know, th- this plea to do more research and see what, you know, dig into what these men are about, I realize that, you know, there's, there's those limitations of what do we actually have you know, and when you're, you're limiting it to, you know, five regiments that, that constricts your letter size, you know, your, your primary source collection even further. Um, so yes, if I could have just a journal from every soldier in the Stonewall Brigade, that would be nice. Great. That's, that's all of our, our dreams, right, as historians. But every once in a while, you stumble onto something that um, is quite impressive, or in the case of the Civil War, really, uh, the social history of the Civil War was largely neglected until about 30 years ago, when folks said, you know, we have a raft of studies of some of these leaders, what about the people in the ranks? So we've asked uh, really new questions um, over the course of the last uh, 30 plus years now. And so uh, this is also an opportunity to highlight um, if you're a history major, Jake, sorry, you've already graduated, but um, for uh, the other two and, and those out there, um, History 470 is our research component um, and our topic shift, but that's where you get to pursue um, the sort of next step or another step in this phase, this iteration, which is pursuing primary sources and asking these kinds of questions you know, about them. And you guys are sort of really modeling um, what we do as historians, uh, both the way you're handling some very sophisticated questions about the secondary literature, but now that you're also um, pushing the envelope, which is to say, okay, here are the primary sources um, I would love to um, jump into and take a look at. And so hopefully uh, we'll see uh, some of you back um, in future years. We hope to do this in person um, instead of virtually next year so we can uh, be a little bit closer um, and uh, share some of our our ideas in person. But it has been a true pleasure this afternoon uh, to work with all of you. And it's um, a testament to the, the great work you've been doing and we greatly appreciate you uh, volunteering your work and scholarship today. So um, we hope, um, this is our last, we, we thought we'd finish strong. So this is our last uh, panel here, our last session, but we do have an award ceremony um, happening uh, at, at uh, 445. So we will wrap it up here, but um, please join us there uh, where we'll wrap things up. And I really appreciate um, everybody's work today. Thank you. <laughs>